thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for attending the talk. And I should also thank Misha for setting up uh, much of the interactive material for my talk too. So I can uh, go into details much more freely. So today I'll be talking about uh, kernel and deep regimes in our parameterized linear models. Um, I'll explain all these terms as I go along the talk. Um, okay, so um, here again, the goal is to understand uh, uh, how from a mathematical understanding of uh, neural networks or more scientifically grounded understanding of neural networks um, based by going through examples which are simple to simple to analyze and trying to extrapolate the in the, the properties we see in simple models to more more complicated neural networks so just to take a step back uh, if we look at most of the deep learning used in practice today they are often very large neural networks trained on very large scale data sets. And a key component of uh, most of these neural networks is some form of loss minimization over observed examples over, uh, using variations of algorithms like gradient descent. Um, so this, as uh, Misha said, a classical ML problem is just uh, empirical risk minimization. So you have a data set of observed examples and you minimize the loss over the observed example over some function class. And typically this function class is parameterized and throughout this talk i'll denote the parameters by w um, if there are variations i'll mention them and uh, as, so coming back to neural networks itself like uh, so in classical machine learning uh, as misha initially alluded to if we have uh, in, in classical machine learning we work in what is called an under parameterized regimes where the number of degrees of freedom for uh, for this function class or the number of parameters, roughly speaking, uh, is much smaller than the number of examples. So the law of large number kicks in or uniform, converge, uh, uniform convergence bonds kick in. And we know that minimizing the empirical loss is all we need to care about. And once we have a good solution for empirical loss based on the theory, we know that we'll have good gen generalization properties to unseen examples. But today's talk will focus on what is called as over parameterized model, or this is equivalent to what Misha calls as Misha had called as interpolating uh, models, where typically the number of parameters is much larger than the number of examples. So I wouldn't read too much into this exact numbers because often the effective dimensionality of the parameters is not exactly like the number of parameters. Uh, but a more functional way to think about what a over parameterization regime is, is to consider this empirical risk minimization loss. And uh, throughout the talk, I'll call something over parameterized if this empirical loss has multiple non equivalent global minimizers. So, what it means is that this loss, whatever it is, uh, has many solutions which perfectly fit the data. All of these are global minimizers of this optimization problem, if I just see it purely as an optimization problem. But on the other hand, most of them will perform poorly on an unseen example, even though they are global minimizers of these empirical risk minimization objectives. And uh, uh, specifically from a generalization point of view and also from like robustness and uh, other things we typically study in this point of view, this creates a problem because we have solutions which are not equivalent. So this learns very different solutions, all of which are global minimizers of this problem. Uh, but we don't know, I mean, uh, the optimization problem itself doesn't tell us what kind of functions to look for. An example would be to fit a linear model through, uh, uh, fit noisy data around a linear model. And if we then constrain the model class, we can get all kinds of uh, fitting, overfitting problems, and also all kinds of good models in, this, in the span of all functions. And the goal is to find out like uh, why, even though neural networks work in this kind of unusual or ill-posed regime, why do we still have good performance on new examples? Because in practice, we do take these kinds of over-parameterized models and use some variants of stochastic gradient descent to minimize these losses. And the solutions we end up with, like uh, subject to a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of fine tuning, does perform, does have good performance on new examples. And we want to get into the core of this. And that is a problem I've been studying for uh, uh, the last few years, which is to understand what kind of functions are learned by uh, stochastic gradient descent, specifically gradient descent, uh, when minimizing over parameterized models. And although this is much more prominent in deep learning setting, like uh, the, one can perceive that such examples even in linear models. 
and much of the past theory we have built up uh, with with of course a few exceptions have been on versions of linear model which already give us quite a good understanding of the problem so just to uh, summarize the results which uh, uh, which have been known like uh, like by end of 2019 or something by our group and a bunch of uh, uh, other groups uh, so what, we started studying this problem in the context of matrix completion or matrix factorization or matrix sensing where you have an underlying ground truth matrix we want to estimate and we observe like say matrix completion linear matrix completion as an example we observe some of the entries of the matrix and in a more general setting you have, you take some linear combination of all the entries of the matrix so xn here denotes some linear measurement matrix and your underlying matrix i am representing as u times v u and v are some lower uh, uh, typically lower dimensional matrices um, so so u times v is a full dimensional matrix and we observe some of the entries of the matrix and we want to do a minimization over u times v and typically we write it in this factorized formulation to ensure that we achieve something called a low rank constraint um, which is which is uh, uh, which is assumed or like uh, hypothesized to be useful for many of these matrix completion tasks which occur in like say recommendation systems and so on. And the interesting phenomenon we observed is that uh, even though like, uh, uh, so even if we don't constrain the U and B matrices to smaller rank or introduce any additional form of regularization, the interesting phenomenon we, uh, we observed is that both in experiments and some very limited theoretical settings, uh, when we simply do gradient descent or uh, gradient descent on these factorized formulations, we convert to solutions which minimize some, something called a nuclear norm of the of the resulting matrix. So we don't have any uh, regularization in the original problem or rank constraint. We simply do gradient descent on the factorized formulation and look at what is the final matrix we end up with. And both empirically and with some theoretical justification, we could show that this does lead to something like a low rank problem, which is our more specifically minimum nuclear norm uh, solution, where uh, the minimizing nuclear norm is previously known to also reduce, introduce um, like low rankness. So it kind of fits in with the theme. And this happens under very specific choices of like uh, hyperparameters. Specifically, this happens when the initialization is very small and also step size is very small. And for theory, we need to quantify what this small means, but empirically for the purpose of this talk, we'll just say that when we take the initialization to be very close to zero and step size to be very small, um, we, do, we do observe that we converge to a minimum nuclear norm solution and a follow-up paper kind of extended uh, our limited theory result to much more general settings with Gaussian measurements. So although we started with the nuclear uh, matrix factorization setting, this result can be has a special case, which is much more easier to understand. So here we go to an even simpler model than matrix factorization, which is simply a linear least squares problem. Uh, so we have an over-determined least square, over-parameterized least squares problem on an underdetermined setting, where I beta is a vector I'm trying to estimate. And I want to estimate a beta such that x times beta approximates y. And the problem here is this is x is a small is a fat matrix. So obviously this has many solutions, like modulo assuming x uh, the rows of x n are sufficiently independent. Uh, this has many several solutions. But we can try to understand which solution different optimization problems lead to. And if I just wrote an optimization problem directly in terms of beta. Um, with a simple calculation, we can show that you converge to, uh, you implicitly converge to a minimum L2 norm solution, even though we didn't add any regularization. But a consequence of this matrix factorization theory is that if you specifically parameterize beta in this weird way, where I take a, a d-dimensional vector w and multiply by it by itself. Uh, I will also later discuss a variant where this, of course, can only produce positive beta. I can, I can also later discuss a variant on how to using it, how to use it for general uh, beta. So we are going to parameterize positive beta as w squared, where it's squared as element wise, and uh, and we are going to minimize the loss function with respect to this specific parameterization. 
Is the problem clear? So it's a simple least squares laws, except that we are using this weird parameterization with uh, like beta represented as W squared. And a corollary of our previous result shows that if you do infinitesimal initialization and infinitesimal step size, the sol solution returned by gradient descent is exactly the minimum L1 norm solution. Of all the possible beta it can return, it will return a solution which has minimum L1 norm. And the later results also show that like you can get similar results if you don't use square, but a power W power D and so on. We'll come back to this particular model in more detail later on, because this would be kind of important to what I'm talking about today too. So this is kind of interesting because uh, uh, in, interesting from a, uh, uh, from an understanding point of view. I just want to clarify that many of the times these optimization algorithms are not necessarily like the best. If you want minimum L1 norm solution, there are better optimization algorithms to achieve minimum L1 norm solution. Uh, but in this setting, it kind of throws a light on like two things. One is the fact that when you have over parameterized optimization problems, the algorithm plays an important role. Using gradient descent on this problem is what leads to minimum L1 norm solution. If I use a different algorithm, it leads to a different solution. And the second important thing, which uh, I will mention, but I'll not talk too much about today, is the fact that uh, uh, like the specific parameterization matters. Even though we are all we are considering just linear models here, re representing linear models as beta directly versus W squared changes what kind of solutions you converge to. And this becomes important because like one can ask why is gradient descent a universally preferred solution? And uh, the, the catch here is that gradient descent on specific architectures lead to different solutions. So you can fix gradient descent and change the parameterization to get different, different optimization, different, uh, different implicit regularization effects. So the architecture does, I mean, if in a neural network context, this parameterization is represented by architecture. So if you think of large neural networks approximating any continuous function, the specific parameterization like convolutions or like transformer models or any of these universally, universal approximators of continuous functions are all, you can think of as different approximations of uh, like the class of all functions. Sure, yeah. Sorry, can I just, um, we're getting some audio issues. So I'm just wondering if you can try turning off your video. Just see uh, if that helps a bit. Okay. Great, thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. So I went into detail about these two results, but uh, these are specifically for square laws. And, and one of the reasons is that I'll be using these as, uh, uh, as a basis for the rest of my talk. But uh, there's been a lot of follow-up work on this, specifically like uh, in the context of extending to classification problems, which I won't talk about much, but just to give a lay of the land. Um, so classification problems, specifically if you use optimized uh, losses, which has like exponential loss or logistic loss, which are commonly used, you need to do a slightly different kind of analysis, which sometimes gives us interesting uh, regimes to work with. And specifically, like the one issue in classification problem is that uh, with, with uh, exponential or logistic loss is that these losses don't have finite minimizers. So if you have a linearly separable data and I do a logistic regression, there is without regularization, there is no finite minimizer for the problem. And in other words, all global minimizers are at infinity, even though this is a, a convex problem. So if I run gradient descent on this problem, eventually you will diverge to infinity. And so you need to ask different questions in terms of what is the classification decision boundary you converge to. And uh, there has been a series of work which uh, generalized much beyond like uh, linear models and also like for, uh, for initial work showed that like how you can represent different linear networks and get different kinds of implicit biases. But a more, rec more recent set of work uh, kind of established that you, you converge to some interesting biases even for nonlinear models. And this is a broad class of homogeneous models. I'll try to come back to this slide in the later point, but I put it here mostly for references and uh, in case people want to look up more in this literature. But uh, going back to uh, Sarah, which is the focus of our uh, talk today, uh, 
so while while we had this while we were building this one line of work uh, few of, few of the groups are building this one line of work on understanding simple models and like uh, trying to generalize to uh, larger models there is another way to approach theory of neural network which is start from the large largest uh, neural networks possible and try to come down to where uh, where we are currently and this theory was essentially developed uh, also simultaneously or like um, or somewhat like offset by a year or so which is based on what are called neural tandem kernels so the basic idea is very simple although the mathematics becomes very um, like tedious to handle so the basic idea is that you take any nonlinear function f which is parameterized by w so the f takes w and x x is the input w are the parameters and you want to expand it uh, do a Taylor expansion of f around the initial uh, let's say an initial value of the parameters w0 so you can do, there is a there is a the function evaluated at w0 then there is the there is a linear term and then the quadratic terms and ha other higher order terms now if we sell this equation we see that uh, if the gradient descent path uh, let's say we are doing gradient descent on this function class and if we somehow establish that the gradient descent path always stays close to the initialization, then we can we can see that we can ignore the higher order terms and just keep the linear term. Right? And in particular, we can approximate uh, our original nonlinear function by a function which is linear in the parameters. This is still nonlinear in the inputs, but it is linear in the parameters. So I'm going to de denote the approximated linear function as f bar and this is simply a first order approximation of our original problem and what i'll be calling as kernel regime in this uh, talk is essentially the settings in which uh, gradient descent iterates w of t which is uh, like the functions generated by doing gradient descent on the original nonlinear problem are very close are exactly equal to or at least very close to the functions generated by this linear approximation or I call it kernel because this is essentially a kernel machine. Although I see it linear, it's just linear in the parameters, not in the uh, inputs. So in particular, it is a linear model over a modified feature map, where the modified feature map is given by uh, the gradient of this nonlinear function at initialization. And this corresponds to a kernel, which, which we call as neural tangent kernel, which essentially establishes a similarity between two input points, x and x. So, uh, so why is this line of work interesting? Because once we establish that gradient descent remains in this kernel regime, we know exactly what gradient descent converges to. Because linear models are very easy to understand from a gradient descent point of view, and specifically, we know that for square laws, you converge to something which minimizes the uh, the RTHS norm to the initializations while fitting the data. So, if if there is some initialization of this function in the function space. And then you converge to a minimum mark HS norm with respect to this neural tangent kernel. And for a squared, uh, for classification problem with exponential chain losses, we know that you converge to uh, something which corresponds to max, maximum margin separator with respect to, again, with respect to this R K H S norm. So once we establish that gradient descent is in the kernel regime, we know a full picture of what gradient descent converges to. And all we need to do is make analyze gradient descent for linear models. Uh, so the question is when do we when are when does gradient flow remain gradient descent or gradient flow which is an infinitesimal step size version of gradient descent remain in the kernel regime and some of the early work which which in this two years has generated a lot of literature essentially established this kind of a kernel behavior when you take very large neural networks essentially neural networks with which go into infinity but a follow-up work kind of uh, took a step back and showed that most function classes which is essentially most Continue, continuously differentiable nice function classes. The kernel behavior is observed, is always observed. It doesn't have to be large networks. The kernel behavior is always observed in certain regime. In particular, the regime is when the scale of the output goes to infinity. The scale of the output is something hard to explain, but if we restrict to what are called homogeneous models, uh, which is essentially like if you scale the parameters by alpha, this final function gets scaled by some scalar function of alpha. 
So for such homogeneous models, essentially uh, the work by Chisat, Alayun, and Bach established that the kernel regime is attained when the scale of the initialization goes to infinity. What does it mean? If I initialize at a, say, my, I have parameters w, I initialize to some uh, fixed vector, and then take a sequence of uh, models which are initialized with the scaling of this vector. As the scaling goes to infinity, you converge to, I mean, th these work established that as, if the scaling is large enough, then you start approximating a kernel model. So this, this is in turn applicable for any model, including linear models. In particular, to state it uh, more formally, if I have a, any, homo, any homogeneous model, like uh, and look at the gradient flow path when the model is initialized with a, with a scale of alpha, scale of alpha, I mean, because we are talking about asymptotics, it only, like you take a constant vector and then scale it by alpha with, a, with alpha as a parameter. And uh, look at the limit when like the function goes to infinity and the scale of the uh, alpha goes to infinity. Uh, then in that limit, uh, the, the theorem establishes that the gradient flow path is exactly traced also by this linearized model. As a consequence, if we specifically for simplicity, if we initialize at an unbiased initialization, if we if your initial predictions are zero, then the solution we converge to is the minimum archaicus norm solution. Okay. And uh, this line of work is in turn like contradictory. It, it, it's so this is in turn uh, because it's applicable for any homogeneous model. This is specifically also applicable for linear models like matrix factorization and like uh, the square parameterization we converged earlier. But this seems to create an apparent contradiction because on one hand we we say that like uh, under certain regimes we converge to a minimum archaicus norm solution. On the other hand, we we did see examples where for homogeneous models under certain other regimes, you converge to solutions like minimum L1 norm or minimum nuclear norm, which cannot be represented by RKHS norms. In particular, the second second uh, example of mi minimizing over this linear model with correct parameterization, we know that you converge to a minimum L1 norm, which cannot be represented by an RKHS norm. So there is a transition away from a kernel regime under certain other settings. And the key, Controlling factor, at least in this example, is uh, is the initialization scale. In particular, we see that the scale of initialization uh, needs to go to infinity for uh, for uh, for the kernel regime to kick in. Whereas, for in order to get minimum L1 norm solution, you need the scale of initialization to go to zero, and that seems to be the key uh, controlling factor, at least for this problem. And we set out to also in more recent work, we set out to understand how does the transition happen between these two regimes for different hyperparameter choices, in particular the initialization scale. And for that, we restrict to this very basic linear model where our inputs are uh, our model is essentially a linear model, but we also want to represent both positive and negative vectors. So instead of writing beta as w square, we write it as w1 square minus w2 square. So this way, uh, over W, you can represent both positive and negative uh, uh, values of beta. And we again study the same setting where we initialize uh, the parameters, which is both W1 and W2 to alpha times all ones vector. It could be any constant vector. Uh, and then we run gradient flow on this problem and study what what is gradient flow converged to uh, as, as we optimize this this uh, this problem and we specifically and in particular we know the two extremes of this case when alpha goes to zero from existing results we know that you converge to minimum l1 norm solution when alpha goes to infinity you get to a minimum l2 norm solution and in between we hope that we hope to establish some kind of an interpolation and indeed we were able to show such an interpolation uh, but with a very un unintuitive regularization so in particular, for any fixed alpha, we were able to show that you converge to some minimizing some uh, some function of beta, which is not a norm, uh, but and it has a very complicated form. But an easier way to see this is to look at the visualization of how this beta, uh, how this q function looks like. So it essentially minimizes um, some kind of a regularizer on each coordinate, and this regularizer looks like an L1 norm as uh, Z, which is an inversely proportional to alpha, or rather alpha goes to zero, Z goes to infinity, and it starts looking like an L1 regularizer. 
and closer to zero, it starts looking like an L2 radial axis. So in particular, this does give us an interpolation between L1 and L2. But a more interesting aspect of it is it also tells us how quickly we get to these L1 and L2 regimes. And in particular, it points out some key difficulties why hyperparameter tuning is painful, is showing that to get to kernel regime, you, uh, you pretty much uh, can get to it by having a polynomially large initialization. Uh, but to get to this L1 regime, you need to go to exponentially small initialization in the worst case. And in many other cases, we need to fine tune this very carefully to, in order to be on the edge of uh, reaching the L1 norm regime, which is the deep regime. So uh, I'm running out of time, so I don't have too much time to go into the other aspects of it. So uh, like we said, like uh, initialization is one aspect which I mean, fine grained analysis of this form lets us analyze, uh, lets us understand how uh, the transition happens and why these hyperparameter tunings are like painful to do and like what regimes we'll be looking at. But it's also interesting to see how the, the effect changes with other hyperparameters. Specifically, we can, con uh, we can look at a version of depth on this model where instead of doing W square, we do W power D as a parameterization. And in this case, we again see uh, interpolation between L1 and L2 norm. But the interesting aspect here, uh, apart from complicated, uh, besides the complicated expressions, the interesting aspect is that you converge to a minimum L L1 norm solution at a much lower, uh, much more easily. So the depth in some sense takes the exponential dependence on initialization to something polynomial. So much more easily, like uh, you converge to a minimum L1 norm solution with higher depth. Uh, similarly, like just uh, take the last minute. Uh, the, uh, I can also stop if you want to skip it for questions. Uh, why, why don't you Why don't you summarize, and then we may not have time for questions. But um... okay, so just summarize. We can also study this in a width regime, and uh, there are some interesting behaviors where we can see that even if um, um, initialization scale goes to zero, if you have a large enough width, it amplifies the initialization sc scale. And you can get kernel regime even in very uh, weird settings. So um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't do justice to the slide, but I would leave it here for references again. Um, sorry, and we can uh, for even going back to the matrix factorization problem, like uh, we can see this transition from minimizing nuclear norm, which is the deep regime, versus minimizing the Frobenius norm, which in this case is the NTK kernel regime, for this problem. And to summarize, we did see uh, in a specific simple example where the optimization flow, uh, uh, optimization bias or the implicit bias from gradient flow transitions from kernel to deep regime based on the scale of initialization. But a larger goal of this line of work is to understand how this transition could depend on uh, a bunch of combination of like initialization, architectural choices, learning rate, and so on. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for going over time. Thank you. Um, uh, very interesting. I think maybe we can uh, sneak in one quick question. Um, so I guess uh, maybe just for context, in the, do you have a sense of in practice whether we're running modern deep networks in the kernel or the rich regime? Um, so and how I would, it impacts your performance. Right. Uh, th there has been, that has been also empirically studied besides our uh, problems, it has also been empirically studied that when we use this kernel approximation, you don't really get good, good performance. And in that sense, like, uh, uh, we do believe that uh, there are at least uh, some deep learning models which work in like non-kernel regime, but we, some of our recent work kind of suggests that going all the way to uh, deep regime, like the extremes of deep regime, which we have been analyzing the asymptotic regimes, uh, might might be very hard, so we might be operating in some transitional regime, and that's one other reason studying this transitional regime is really important. Uh, and I, if we don't have explicit theory for what specific neural network we use, which regime the specific neural network we use in practice depend on, but uh, there is enough empirical and theoretical evidence to show that it is possibly operating either in the transition or in the deep regime and at least Great. significantly away from kernel. Okay, well, thank you very much.